never talked about holidays at all and the only holiday that she thought she had was when she was evacuated <laughs> for a very short time. They never had holidays. I mean they were all poor, they were working class, you didn't have holidays then. Well certainly not with the family, we went with um, a trip where I lived, the church felt, you know, took the kids out. Um, down to a, ho a week's holiday a few days away down in Sussex in a place called Midhurst. When I was young, it was mainly boarding houses um, when we could afford it. Uh, always during the school summer holiday, it was for a few days. These were, I can remember them being quite grim, uh, very basic, dark, inhospitable places that y you stayed in and uh, you were pleased to, to get out for the day. Um, and that was just a few days during the school summer holiday, which had to be sort of taken into account because there were scouts and their summer camp, and they were, that was far more exciting. There wouldn't have been any holidays for my, my parents or grandparents. Their holiday was hop picking. So every September, they went down to Kent picking hops, uh, like a busman's holiday. Um, they got paid for it. Us kids got the fresh air. It was usually six weeks, so um, that was our holidays, if you like. Husbands used to stay at home, obviously, because they were working in the factories, and maybe come down occasionally to visit at the weekend. But it would it'd be the mums and the, the older children, and that. us younger children used to run around fishing for tiddlers and picking blackberries. Uh, but yeah, and they, I don't know how much they got paid, probably about tuppence so every time they filled the hops up and the hops were collected. We lived in huts, we cooked on an open fire uh, and then when that became mechanised, the late 50s, no one went off picking anymore and, and we went to our first holiday camp, which is a place called Laysdown in, in, on the Isle of Sheppey. I don't think my dad ever went on holiday, but my, although they lived in Hackney, my mum's family was slightly better off than the average. Her father took them on holiday to the seaside. And then when they got married, they went to holiday camps in the 30s um, because they were just starting then. They were a new thing. Prior to 1938, um, there was no paid holiday. So that was a huge thing that by statute through Parliament that people could actually have that. But this allowed them a week off with pay, which allowed them to, to go away for the first time. So really that was a huge part in developing the kind of the development of the holiday camps. My mother went to Caister holiday camp in, I think it was Norfolk, Caister. Um, and she went there several times. And my father went to a variety of places. He went to Butlins, he went to Pontins. Yeah, I mean, the first one was, uh, it was the only Butlins I'd ever done as a kid, and that was in Bognor Regis. Um, 
and thereafter we we went to Pontins, but we never did any repeat visits. So I kind of got to be in different parts of the country. So it was Camber Sands, Breen Sands, Wick Ferry, um, only one up north, Southport. That was really cold, so we never went back up north again. Although there were differences within the camps, they were similar as well. So I think one of the things probably my parents liked was you knew what you were going to get because probably the blueprint for one camp was, I imagine, similar to the, you know, they all had swimming pools and the activities and the chalets. They weren't affluent. I think they would worked out that Butlins was affordable for them. The kosher hotels in Bournemouth, where my husband went as a child, were very expensive in comparison. And also things to do. Once you got to Butlins, everything was there for you. The thing was that you didn't need money uh, because everything was like paid for up front. And so, you know, the kids could go wild doing whatever they wanted to. Because I think if you take kids somewhere, money's tight. It's all sort of like, oh, can I have money for this? Can I go on that ride? Can I go on this ride? Can I go whatever. So uh, it's just all in all, it's a really great idea. Uh, my mum and dad split up very early. So we just had mum and mum was of ill health. So money was very, very tight. And uh, our annual holiday was uh, to Whitecliffe Bay holiday camp uh, on Benbridge on the Isle of Wight. We used to go down every Whitsun week without fail from as long as I can remember to the late 70s, early 80s. We decided we'd have a holiday, me and my friend, me and my mate Iris, and we decided we'd go to a holiday camp for a bit of freedom. The whole purpose of this holiday was to get away from our mum and dad and work and have the freedom and then look for a bloke. And that's being totally honest. And we went to Butlins at Clacton and my mum and dad came and took, saw us off at Victoria Coach Station and they was highly delighted that at least I was getting out of their way and it little, little did he know what went on in holiday camps. From literally from when I was born up until I was a teenager, we almost went to a holiday camp every year. We had a couple of exceptions and it was an absolute bloody disaster because it rained every single day. It was just really miserable and I'm sure that's what convinced my mum and dad that never again, let's back to Pontins again, we're safe. If it chucks it down, we've got some things to do. We could never go to Pontins in July and August, we didn't have the money. We would always go out of season. So there's pictures of my brother and sister at holiday camp St Mary's Bay in, um, in Devon at Pontins and they've got Parker coats on. I went to two different holiday camps. These were Nalgo holiday camps. National Association of Local Government Officers, where my father was part of that union. Uh, he came home one day with their um, newspaper, magazine, uh, and there was like an advert for going to a holiday camp. And I'm thinking, well, what's all this about? Yeah, I've never, never heard of anything like this before in my life. <clears throat> and there were two now go camps. There was one called Caton Bay, which was up in Scarborough, and there was one called Croyd Bay in North Devon. Croyd Bay. <laughs> That's it. I, we went to the same one over and over again. No others. Yeah, first went in 1961. But I think I worked out once I'd been 52 times. <laughs> it was run by the union, so it was for people who were, who were part, members of the union. And it was to bring them together in a way that they wouldn't ordinarily come together. You know, it's somewhere that, that was in those days very affordable. Um, whereas other holidays with a lot of children wasn't, weren't, just weren't affordable. was meticulous. So I can still see the handwritten list taped on the inside of the suitcase with things ticked off as they went in in a very particular order. My mum had lists. 
She had lists of, there was one called sundries that had all the things like plasters and, you know, um, I don't know, all the, all the extra things. And then there was, for each of us, each child, there were five of us. So each child, she had a list of what we had and it would be like, you know, two t-shirts, one dress, two shorts, you know, whatever it was. Then, then those suitcases would be put on the roof rack, covered in plastic, um, which used to flap all the way down to Devon. I did find a picture by the time 1956 came of the Morris Minor and a great big trunk on the roof. So they had a roof rack and a big green trunk in canvas with wooden struts over it. And that, I suppose that was tied on, but I just wouldn't have cared if we'd had any luggage or not. Chaos. <laughs> um, the night before, Mum used to have my sister and me uh, sort out what we wanted to take, get the cases out of the loft, move the Christmas tree out of the way. And um, yeah, it was, it was very, very fond memories. You didn't have a lot of clothes in the 50s either, so you would take your best dress if you was, you know, the dresses had all this full, and your, your special four and a half inch stiletto shoes, which I love, I still like them. And we just went in the coach and down we went. We thought we was very grown up at 17 and a half, but really we was just silly giggly girls. They're not mature like today and uh, look forward to getting down to Portsmouth or Southampton to get a car ferry over to the Isle of Wight. It was a massive thing for us in them days. We had an old Ford Zephyr car, um, so there was four kids in the back and I'd developed the knack of being sick by the time I'd reached the corner of our road in Wimbledon. Um, so I got the prime position. It was a bench seat across the front. Um, so I, I was in there in between mum and dad, really. It was a better position to be in. Our family, there were six of us, and I can remember in the early holidays when we were going to places like Breen Sands and um, we had a Morris 1100, which if you look at today, it's not much bigger than a mini. So there's my mum and dad in the front and there's four kids <laughs> wedged in the back. Then there's all the luggage in the boot, but also luggage on us and all our sandwiches and crammed into this little car that must have been making sparks down the road as we're kind of like weighed down at the back. And we'd leave at three o'clock in the morning. We all sat on the stairs while my dad put everything into the car and we all had to sit on the stairs. We were allowed to have one soft toy to take with us. And then we would all get in the car and we would drive and we would break our journey for breakfast and breakfast was always the same. It was always white crusty rolls with craft cheese slices and uh, orange squash in plastic bottles. My dad would then have a sleep because we would have left at between three and four in the morning and we all had to sit in the car quiet while my dad had to sleep. There must have been people in the coach all getting on at Victoria with our... You had those funny cases, you didn't have rucksacks or posh cases, you, the brown cardboard thing. Yeah, Liverpool Street, the start of the holiday really, the steam trains and uh, the smell of it and the smoke. You know, steam trains now look all very shiny, but they were all black and gritty, but still exciting. Me putting my head out the window and uh, getting soot in my face, and my mum shouting at me, but uh, I'll lose my head if I leave my win head out the window. It seemed a long journey. Um, yeah, when you're a kid, everything seems to be longer or larger or, um, yeah, and exciting to get to the fresh air of the seaside. The best bit for me was, and there's a road that goes out from Broadham Burrows and goes round the corner into Croyd Bay. And you go, as you go around the corner, the bay itself and the sea and the sand and the hills just appear as if by magic, a magic moment. And my heart always misses a beat when you go round that corner and you think, we've arrived. And you pull up in the car park and we're there. And I think that's the special moment for me. My first impressions, looking for the other kids that always used to go there every year, of which three of them are still my best friends. We met up when we was 10 and 50 years on, we still see each other. So it was a case of if they wasn't on the port at Southampton, we were looking for them when we got there. That was the thing. It was the first impressions. Where are they? 
I remember driving through the sort of doorway and I thought I've never seen anything like it because my parents did these holidays abroad where we were in a hotel or something and I, I went there and I thought oh, this is so different and I loved the little huts we were in. And the excitement of getting in, going through the gates in the camp, lining up at the reception hall with everybody else and being checked in, given our badges, given our keys, given our allocation to the chalet. Um, so when you arrived at a big holiday camp, so I went to places of different size. So Canberra Sands Breen sides are absolutely enormous. I mean, I, I don't know the figures, but they probably had six or 7,000 people there. So they're almost like a mini town. So if you imagine 7,000 people leaving the holiday camp and 7,000 people arriving, the initial experience was a bit like kind of rush hour at Waterloo Station or something, with people going in different directions, all carrying suitcases. Some people looking probably a little bit glum because they're going home. Other kids like me really excited that the holiday's about to begin. Um, and then you had that opportunity to get onto the, they, they often had at the bigger camps, they had the little luggage train where you could get onto that. So that's part of the experience of arriving at your chalet. close to the sea so you got the the ozone and salt smells which you you know living in Tottenham you never got so that was nice. Enjoying the newness of it because it always seemed sort of well it did seem new because we lived in a Victorian house and uh, our area was built in um, Victorian times but uh, this was all bright and shiny and modern and new yeah so colourful. When I was born we lived in a two up two down terrace um, no garden, well, tiny little yard. Uh, you played in the street. So, you know, suddenly you're in Devon, you've got fields all around you, you've got you know, big greens, you've got, let alone the beach and the, and the sea. Um, so it was a complete break from, from um, you know, their normal lives. You'd kind of only experience people from kind of the London area, but all of a sudden you've got like a group of Geordies come down or people from the Midlands who sound completely different to you and supported other football teams. You'd see all their shirts and go, wow, I've seen them before. Never seen someone who supported Newcastle United. And then you're mixing with them and you kind of think, so there's a bit of a melting pot and it's quite an interesting experience. I think the people who went there were very working class. They all seem to, you know, you do notice when people are different different accents, different finances, and everyone seemed like us. We were very comfortable with the other people at the camp. We had heard, um, the people who worked there, that the, um, the, the campsite had been used to house prisoners of war in the Second World War. Now, whether that was true, I don't know for certain, but um, there was always a bit of a, a wry humour about it, with people thinking, yeah, I can tell, <laughs> you know, particularly as there was a sort of a high security around the uh, boundary with lots of um, barbed wire and that. But I mean, it was to keep everybody safe really and not to have people breaking in. So I can understand it. As a kid, I was br brought up in a prefab and on the Isle of Dogs, half of the island was smothered in prefabs and it looked like, looked like holiday camp. Um, and when I got to um, the, the first one and to see the, it's like, like being home, you know, all these little chalets or prefabs. Um. It was very basic, but then where we were all living, where we lived was very basic. It was a small flat with six kids in it, so you didn't have a separate bedroom or anything. So in a way, this was quite nice. We had our own little bit of space, but no kettle, only to wash. There was no, no, no such thing as a shower. I can't remember how we washed. It was probably in the sink. So the chalet that we stayed in, I do remember, obviously there was greenery outside, which was really nice, and we had our own um, little front door, whereas, because at the time in East London, we lived in a flat, so we would have, you know, go up the stairs. To, so I really like that, because it's almost like having a little house. Basic, I think, sort of brightly coloured. They seem to think that painting the outside in bright colours made up for the lack of anything great inside. Um, you know, I don't recall there being any TVs or anything of that nature. There might be a radio in, in the rooms. 
um, but it was sort of beds and, and shelving. They called it a chalet, but it was kind of like a hut, kind of a, a nice hut, a chalet hut, a wooden thing with steps going up and the kids were in bunk beds and uh, me and my late partner was in, was in a double in this place. Stuff was clean, it was washed. Uh, because it was a countryside, I was a bit like, ah, there's a spider, ah, there's a creepy crawly. But that's because it's a countryside and I'm from London, I'm not used to insects running around. Basic wardrobe and, yes, I remember flowered curtains and a loudspeaker for the announcements to come through. Because literally it was like, you went in the door, there was a bed, a gap, another bed, and then there's literally a sink and a toilet, and that, that, that was it. And it's you know, very, very, uh, very small, if, you know, the size of the actual chalet as such. We were fully catered, so there was the huge dining rooms. Reminds me a little bit later on when I worked works canteen sort of thing and you had your place to sit but you didn't order what you wanted so the food came, the plates were stacked up on a carry thing and they'd walk round and if you saw something with what you wanted you had that one. You know I have an image of when we went to breakfast and say we'd be woken up in our chalet by the bing bong first or second service and we'd go down to the to me at the time, maybe because I was little, it seemed a massive cafeteria. And also the, the serving times, you know, there was first serving or second serving, so you had to turn up. There wasn't any leeway, really, I think. Or, well, we always got there on time. <laughs> Big, noisy, cutlery rattling, people moving up and down. You had to be in at meal times at the precise time. When the door shut, that was it. If you came in late, there was a forfeit to pay uh, and uh, it was either sort of singing a song or, um, I don't know, running down to the beach and back. <laughs> it's just, just little forfeits. Well, there would be a camp compare, a, a chief entertainer, and if you arrived late, he did forfeits and a girl who we didn't know came in late and he drew attention to her because she'd come late and he said for her forfeit she must kiss a bald man's head and she looked around and she came up and kissed the back of my father's head and he was quite upset because he didn't realise he had a bald patch until she kissed it. And you'd be talking, all be talking about what you'd been up to. You'd all be sitting filthy with sand under the table and dirty clothes, probably in a wet swimming costume or, you know, so it was, it was, it was a bit chaotic, but it was really good fun. The babies were in a nursery and you had to feed them separately in a high chair. So you'd go to a different building and feed the babies and then you'd come back and have your meal with the family or it might have been vice versa. And I just found this took up the whole day. I didn't really have a holiday at all because I was going to feed in the baby, then coming back for breakfast, then going to feed her lunch, then coming back for lunch, then going to feed her evening meal, then coming back for the evening meal, and then taking her home. And I just thought, oh, I'm not doing this again. I just, it's just too much. So I'm pretty sure that the Devon Coast Club, that it was all, it was full board. That was the only option at the time. I think that was one of their selling points, I seem to remember, so all the, uh, all the meals were in the same place, you know, three meals a day in the same place. And I think they you know, prided themselves on that being a bit different and there was separate tables you could have rather than, I think a lot of the other ones, um, my memories of those more communal tables where, you know, you just piled in with a, you know, whoever else happened to be sitting at that table. Whereas, you know, these were, you know, you got your table for four, you were together. Um, there were menus and choices. And I think they tried to sell that as part of their, you know, the, the being slightly posher than the other camps. And the food wasn't great, but, you know, it, you, it filled you up, that sort of thing, and yeah. And it was nice to choose your own food as well, because like if there was a buffet or, or from the menu, that was quite interesting. You felt a bit grown up choosing from a menu or choosing your own food from the buffet. There were waitresses, you didn't go up and get your own meals, and I think there was plenty of food. It was the sort of diet we were used to, meat, potatoes and greens, and desserts. Very traditional. Yeah, it was always the same, and it was the same every year. It didn't ever change. There were always puddings, 
which was always good because they was always puddings with custard and the custard was really nice. I always remember the custard being delicious at Croyd. Initially it was only fully catered so the self-catering came much later um, and that was one of the reasons that we went because it meant that for two weeks my mum didn't have to cook at all. I know in the early Butlins camps they used to have um, catered for holidays to give mum a rest but we always went economy so Poor, my poor mum never got rest, so we'd, we'd have a little stove and so she'd still be cooking for us, so we'd have our meals inside the chalet. Self-catering. I still have nightmares now when I'm in a supermarket and I see a tin of processed peas or new potatoes. Because that was the staple diet, mum used to get a tin of peas or a bag of peas, a tin of new potatoes. And on the site, they had a little supermarket and before 10 o'clock in the morning you could order a ready-cooked chicken for pick-up at tea time. There was a wonderful sense of freedom in the holiday camp that I would go with my, normally with my older brother, we'd go to the games room and just spend all day doing different activities and then we'd rush back and my mum would make us a sandwich and then we'd go to the swimming pool and be there or we'd grab a football and go out into the park. So it was just like being busy all the time. As I say, you had a, a leaflet come through the door telling you what was going on and there were announcements all the time like the Bonnie Baby competition is taking place by the pool. Um, Miss Bogner or something like that is here. So there were things going on all the time. There were children's clubs. There were dancing in the afternoon that the adults would do. There was something going on all the time and more than one thing. So if you wanted to play bingo, there was that. If you wanted to do the dancing, there was that. The so ones that I loved were swimming, the swimming pool and um, table tennis. My dad taught me to play table tennis. In general, I say everyone seemed quite happy, really. You know, people running around, kids running around, always things to do. And they had all these um, real experts. I can remember when we went to St Mary's Bay, they had a guy called Chester Barnes, who was like the English national um, table tennis champion. But snooker was a big thing on the TV at the time. And Ray Reardon was in the billiards hall doing trick shots. And so you stood in and watched all these people you'd seen on the telly. But they would like, you know, they'd put a film on if it's pouring with rain, because like I say, like, a lot of it was centred around sitting around the swimming pool, really. And if it was pouring with rain, you, you couldn't do that. So they'd, they'd put other things on for you during the day. Yeah. They had quad bikes, which were like a family thing. So they'd take four. And they were a little bit, because obviously when I was going there, I was a little bit young, so a bit too big for me to be at the steering wheel and controlling it. But then they had these like little Formula One cars. I don't know what they called them. I used to just like speed around kind of canvas sands, pretend, you know, a bit like James Bond. I've got my little car, feeling like really grown up. The bicycles were tricycles. So there is a picture of three of us on the bike. So we would cycle into Skegness, which is the nearest town. I could sense that they particularly didn't like Butlin people coming into their town. I was always really sporty as a kid, so I, I liked anything that involved any kind of sporting activity. So there'd be, there'd be games going on, there'd be set times for swimming, and quite often we'd go off with my dad, and as I said, that's where I learned to swim. There was always a range of things that you could do, and if you didn't want any, the family didn't want to do certain things, we had free time, you know, canvas sands, we'd just wander over and spend the day on the beach, do some sandwiches up. And of course the blue coats and all that looked after like the children during the day, there were different games, like even games of football and things like that, you know, sort of, uh, it, was a, it was great really, because it, as a parent, they took the children off your hands for a bit, you know what I mean? Everybody always being G'd up that you've got to have a good time and you've got to be busy and you've got to be doing something all the time and we will make sure that you have a jolly good holiday. I don't think there was that much available. It's very regimented, isn't it, a holiday camp? And, and I'm not into regimentation at all. I even knew that at that age. And probably lots of red coats getting people doing things. And they made it a very happy environment and a happy holiday. 
they always seem glamorous, actually, I think. To me as a toddler, they always seem quite glamorous in their uniforms. The camp's entertainment officer, um, who, who was always given the nickname of Sporty, and uh, who was, uh, he was responsible for doing everything, a one-man band. And uh, week in, week out, every day of the week, <coughs> no day off. I don't know how he survived. The compere, whose name was Bruce, he was Whitecliffe Bay Holiday Camp in our eyes. And as soon as we got there, everyone went looking for him. And when I look back at it, the poor bloke, poor bloke, because he just had thousands of kids to send on him. Well, this is something I didn't know. I wish they'd have told me they had fancy dress. I wish I'd have brought a fancy dress with me. We didn't know what to do about that. So when we got there, we thought, oh no, fancy dress, we've got nothing to wear. But people uh, may do it with what we could find. And a lot of people went as something sort of Arabic because they're all dressed in the curtains from the chalets. <laughs> I remember the men, I don't know why they would dress up as women. And I do remember my dad dressing, like putting my mum's tights on and things, but it was, and it, it was, it was a bit weird. There was one evening when I think it must have been cross-dressing, but I don't remember women dressing up, the men dressed up as women. And my dad made the most disgustingly awful looking woman. So that was always, you know, he was, he was the sort of star because he looked so dreadful. I do very much remember a, a fancy dress competition where probably for the only time in my life I dressed up as a girl. I think I was about 10, 11 years old and I dressed up as a, a flapper girl with all the Charleston gear on and um, came third, which was very annoying because when they, when they came out giving out the prizes and they asked my name and I said it was Martin, they, they apologised because they thought I was a girl. And had they, had they known I was a boy, I may have come higher up, which really annoyed me because my younger brother just turned up wearing his football kit, which he'd been wearing all day anyway, uh, and came second. Not that I'm still holding the grudge 40 odd years later. We won the fancy dress competition as Princess Elizabeth and her bridesmaids. My mum spent all week making costumes and she, they were always crepe paper, unbelievably. They were never material. And apparently there was a bit of ill feeling afterwards because people said she'd put too much effort in. It wasn't meant to be like that and be all sort of lovely. <laughs> Improvising on dressing up, um, I mean... Uh... <laughs> A wire night, all the girls were down the beach cutting the reeds and making their grass skirts and we were cutting jeans up and making uh, shorts. There was a picture of me dressed as a witch which my mother thought was appropriate because I looked a bit like a witch, she thought, because I hadn't got any teeth. So there were tournaments which some of us entered and some of us didn't, um, all different things. So things like shove halfpenny and bowls and Bool and table skittles and table tennis and I mean loads and I usually did a couple because we were encouraged to mum and dad would say no come on enter a couple of tournaments enter a couple of tournaments they're collecting the badges oh you've got badges if you were on your second week you've got a badge and if you entered a competition you've got a badge and my father made us a long long ribbon and every year we added to it with the badges and you'd walk around very proudly showing them off well, there were activities, but I don't think me and Iris, Iris took much interest in the activities. You know, noggly knees and things. And we certainly weren't beauty queens because they used to do all that, you know, find a nice, glamorous girl. We, we didn't do that. Well, perhaps we didn't get picked. <laughs> <laughs> I have distinct memories of my dad winning the knobbly knees contest and feeling probably mortified at the time because they, they had these guys and they made them stand on these steps, obviously roll, roll their uh, trousers up and then blindfolded women would go along this line feeling the knees. Um, one, two, three, four. A bit like a, a knee identity parade minus the vision. My parents did enter a lot of the competitions and two I remember vividly were my father. One was the best dressed man on holiday. And he entered another competition where they had to use their non-dominant hand to empty their pipe, repack their pipe, light their pipe and get it smoking. And he won that one. There was um, a competition to become either Miss Nelgo or Mr Nelgo. Um, and Miss Nelgo was always a, a, a young pretty girl. But it was a bit like a Miss World contest. You, you had to line up and stand there 
and uh, and be selected. It, it was a it was a bit like, it was a bit of a cattle market. In the first holiday camps I went to, so at Canberra Sands early sixties. I'm only a baby, but I know I was a finalist in the Bonnie Baby because um, I've actually got the picture. Uh, my mum's looking really cool, kind of nice 1960s haircut and kind of like a little kind of stiletto heels on and me sitting on her knee with a kind of like a big grin on my face. I've got pictures of myself of being in a, like a beauty pageant, which they probably, I don't think they would do that now, but, you know, little girls lined up with a number um, and things like that. And, we, and I was about eight or nine. <laughs> The next competitions, as we got older, were always on, they were always sporting things. And the main one for me was always the table tennis tournament because it was just an opportunity to get one over my big brother. Um, it was like I was better at it than him and I knew I was going to beat him. Just amazing to run about and go on to all the rides infinitely if you wanted to. Yes, I remember being on a, a carousel, it's, it, it's a, a roundabout with swings on long chains. I remember that, they were really long. And when you got on them, then it would, you would spin right out. Um, it, it really a little bit unnerving, but exciting. There were a few scares. I mean, my middle boy, he's always been a bit, a bit of a devil, really. He got run over by the Noddy train, so, <laughs> but he was okay. That's because he, he was just, too eager, you know. Yeah, I do remember the arcades. I remember the penny arcades, and I do remember enjoying those. Um, my sister was a bit cheeky, really, because she'd go, Deb, come on this one, and she'd watch me spending my money, and I'm thinking, hold on a minute. If you got the 10p jackpot, the bells would all light up, and you know, sounds would play, and everyone would crowd round to see who'd won the, you know, the amazing jackpot, um, which of course you then just either spend on sweets or chuck back in the machine again. So my dad knew how to get rid of us, because their main obsession was the penny, the, the two penny drop machines. So he'd just give us a massive bag of two penny coins and you probably got addicted to that kind of thrill of the, the drop and the money dropping out and you're not being able to do it because you've run out of money. But I kind of had a look around, there's no blue coats, no one around, give it a massive whack. But when I did it in one of these things, all the alarms started going off and the kind of a bit of a panic that suddenly like someone's gonna grab me, your Nick Sunshine. The swimming pools, they were a big feature of uh the camps as well. Yeah, they were wonderful. They were part of the sounds and the smell of it. Really light and bright fountains, that swimming pool colour. That was something I'd never seen before, an outdoor swimming pool. But you had the wonderful fountains at either end um, and you'd sit on the fountains and I can just, they seemed enormous, but I don't know if they were. When you were in one of the lounges I think they were you could see people swimming on them because there were glass walls there yeah I do remember sort of swimming up to the glass and looking at people looking at us and that sort of thing well one of the swimming pools had a, a water slide and I despite the fact I couldn't swim desperately wanted to go on the water slide so we had to organize for people who could swim to be in the water when I hit the water <laughs> there was the, the outdoor pool that was forever, you know, minus seven degrees, but still packed full of kids and because um, it didn't matter when you were that age. But you were there for a whole week, so you're going swimming every day. So when I was like learning to swim, I think uh, I could think back to 1972 when you had um, the Olympics, Mark Spitz won all these gold medals. So I'd see that on the telly and I thought, I want to be like Mark Spitz. So I'd get into the thing and try and kind of like, when I was obviously had no idea what I was doing, but my dad would try and show us how to do the front crawl. So I think well, I was like Mark Spitz. Sometimes during the day they played music over the uh, tannoy system, 
speakers everywhere. They played lots of hits, but there's only one that stuck in my mind was um, that Cliff Richard's song, Please Don't Tease. But when you hear it all over the camp, like all the speakers, you hear it, the speaker that's nearest you, but it seems to fill, fill the air, you know? I think that was um, the last time I went to, yeah, I was 15, that was the last time I ever went to, to Butlin. So that kind of signed it off. If I play that, very rarely, but if I do play it and close my eyes, that's where I am. There was lots of music, certainly the same songs. They all had themes, John. I remember you had Butlin's and Ponsons and the Devon Coast Club had theme songs. They used to play the same songs every day. Um, I think the Devon Coast Club even released a record of those that they used to play all the time, sort of jazz, salsa classics um, that would come on every time there was something to come on, on would come the theme song, which was which was called Small Hotel. And you just hear the same song over and over again and you'd sing it for weeks when you got home as a kid. Um, and so you got out of your head in time you know, for the next year when you went back and heard it all again, the same songs, the same entertainers. So clearly there was, there was a, you know, a continuity of, of staff there, um, which must say something about it. Early evening, you'd have like bingo. That was absolutely like a must, I think, that people you know, play bingo. In the ballroom, they'd often have the blue coats put on a big, now I'm talking about blue, I never mentioned red coats because my mum would never countenance butlins, it always had to be pontins. They would put on a show at the end of the week and you kind of met these people because as kids, they'd, um, they'd put on some of the entertainment and thing for, for the children and then you'd see them and they'd run the kind of table tennis competitions and then they'd be up on stage. So we were allowed to watch them and I think there was a kind of watershed moment. It was about nine o'clock, all the kids had to be out. So you'd put the baby down to sleep and you'd put the young boys down to sleep and then you'd go out and have a drink with your husband or go for a dance or anything. They had child patrol. So if there was a child crying, it would be baby crying in chalet number 10. Babe. And, and then those parents would go back to that chalet. Say like at Warner's, they were yellow coats that they wore at Warner's. You know, they would either do a show or they'd have somebody from outside come in like do magic or ventriloquist or that, that type of stuff. And then there'd be sort of more band music at the end. Massive great places to, to, to watch. I mean, the um, auditorium was huge, huge. Loads and loads of people sitting there with their families around tables drinking and... And people would always dress up nicely for the evening. You know, like, I think it's like um, expected, I think, because he's going into like a ballroom and like you're having a drink and socialising and you, you would dress up. The shows were very good. Um, my mum loved the dancing and the musicals. I remember there was one show with the comedian Freddie Starr, but my, my dad was scandalised because he swore a lot. In his, in, his, um, in his show, so that stood out. But generally the shows were fantastic. You know, the dancers were very good, and really nice music. They had the, like, I think they're called blue coats, uh, were the ones who did the most of the entertainment. They didn't have anyone flash coming in from outside or anything, but they were good. They were obviously budding stars. It reminded me of uh, Saturday Night at the Palladium they used to do in the 1960s on the telly. It was like that. Low budget, but it didn't show. <laughs> <laughs> they were just local, local acts. It was nothing like, like you know, Butlins, Pontins that had named people that would come in. It was nothing like that. It would be someone from Braunton who sang, um, you know, Neil Diamond songs. I think the entertainments for me were always revolved around the the campus concert on the Thursday night, where we rehearsed. To, to get an order, um, what was going to come on first, how it was all going to work. And that was all down to us. Whoever turned up for the very first rehearsal, you know, we, we were the committee, we were the uh, producers, we were the directors, we were the actors, we were the singers, the dancers, we were everything. I asked my dad about this last week and um, he said, my brother was there as well, and, and I said, tell me your memories of Croyd. And he said, um, the dancing in the evening was one step from heaven and it made me cry. 
<laughs> because it was so beautiful what he said um, and that's true and I, I loved the dancing too and it felt very grown up being in a ballroom and being taught to do grown up dances and my mum she loved the dancing she went for the dancing we got dolled up and we went into this dance hall and I can still see it to this day it was massive and we sat round the edge on a chair and then the blokes would be the other side and they'd all be eyeing you up and down but you'd be having a look and then they'd walk right across the floor and ask you to dance. Well, you couldn't refuse, could you, when the poor sods walked all across the floor? Unlike most people, we went for two weeks. Most, it was only geared for one week. So after the first week, the, uh, the whole thing repeated itself. It's like being trapped in that film Groundhog Day. So after the first week, uh, all the entertainment and everything was repeated because it's really just aimed for people to go for a week. Sometimes mum would say, we're going to go for a drive. And we would go for a drive to a tourist attraction on the Isle of Wight. Even if we did go out to somewhere, I'd be hankering to get back to the camp because I want to play with my friends. Yes, the holiday at, um, at Clacton. Uh, the last holiday I was there, I think, going outside the camp with my sisters because you were allowed to go outside the camp. And I remember that experience and uh, we didn't like it. it. It kind of broke the spell. So we couldn't see why well, anyone would want to go out. But we had to explore to see, see what was on the other side. The other thing was the three line whip was the family photo on a Friday. I think it was a Friday, might have been on a different day, where everybody used to walk in family groups around the green. So they did a whole camp photograph of everybody, of which we have many, and then they would do family photos and you'd walk, the photographer would stand there and you'd walk around towards him and he would take a photograph of your family and then you could buy the photograph. Camp photographer would seem to be everywhere and you would hope to be captured. I mean, that was an exciting thing because they take the, the shots during the day. They had a photographic shop and in the window they'd have all the pictures that the photographer would take during the day. So a lot of people would go and look and see if they're in them. And of course you could buy them as well. There's a sense of freedom. There's no adults telling you what you cannot do and what you must do and you've got to be in at a certain time and you do as I say. That was wonderful. We didn't have any of that. We could do what we wanted. Uh, you won these competitions to see how many people you could cram into a telephone box. Uh, and so, so we had these chalet parties and uh, uh, and, uh, and that's how we sort of got, got to know each other. We all sort of crammed in, all teenagers, and uh, it, was, it was just fun. It was, you know, it was, it was good stuff. There were definitely um, sexual experiences of varying le levels at Croyd. Um, lots of misbehaviour, lots of smoking. Uh, smoking, drinking, lots of um, canoodling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I want to think about those. I, I had some uh, friendships with girls uh, at, on the during the holiday, but it was impossible to keep those friendships going because invariably they were living in another part of the country. Uh, no such thing as mobile phones or texts or anything. And uh, uh, yeah, the best you could do is write them a letter, and uh, and and that soon sort of fizzled out. And we're all sitting at the tables, and I can still see him now. He comes. Oh, he was handsome. He was really gorgeous, and he said, "We'll come and dance." So we had a dance, and then he, he wanted a, you know, and no, no, no. I said, "I don't do things like that." I didn't, you know. Um, and then I had my kiss, my first kiss. Oh, Pontins by the sea, where I met you, Valerie. Pontins by Brackwichon Bay, where you made my holiday. For as soon as I saw you, Miss Valerie Hughes, you made me lose all my blues. 
you made me as happy as can be when you kissed me, Valerie. She used to come out with this little saying, um, I ain't love grand when you got it in your hand, but it's a bit of a bugger when you can't get the other, and uh, so I had to marry her. <laughs> now I'm in my 50s and looking back at that, it's a week where you were just together totally. Because my, my dad used to work long hours overtime trying to sort of pay for us. So often you didn't do lots of things with him and that was the week of year you did do lots with him. You're in the swimming pool with him and he's playing with you. So that's the things that stay with you, I think. Especially later on when I had the four children, I mean, it was quite a busy time for my pap. And um, I suppose I was there to sort of take a little bit off of uh, back if you know what I mean. <laughs> and we did it together then, you know, which was quite nice. I mean, where I was away working on the old River Thames and she did nose to work with the children. And I was able to help her. The kids, that was the thing we were happy about. The kids just vanished, uh, which is, I'm not saying I don't like the children, but um, it was nice uh, that they went off and they were, they were so happy. And I think what makes the adults happier, it's, sort of like, it's not sort of bothered by what I'm doing. It's like, are the children happy, then we can relax. So I think although they had a load of activities there, I think a lot of people with children went there to sort of like lay back and relax from having young children. We try to have a little bit of, um our own time, Pat and I, you know, like, especially the dance, the dancing and all that was quite nice, and the dance hall, you know, and he liked a bit of dancing. They, they were certainly more relaxed um, in a holiday environment, even though she was still responsible for a lot of the family things. But yeah, I, mean, it, I look back at the photos now and they were really happy. They were having a good time. At the end of the evening, we always sang a song Good night, campers. And I can remember joining in, really, everybody joined in and really enjoyed it. Good night, campers, see you in the morning. <laughs> Good night, campers, see you in the morning. Good night, campers. Long do, do, do. I can't remember, but they used to sing that every night. Good night, campers, wash your dirty faces. Good night, campers, don't sleep in your braces. Drown your sorrows, bring your bottles back tomorrow. Good night, campers, good night. So it was, it was going home because you, you played with that kid for a week. You didn't know if you were going to see him again for a year. I hated it. I absolutely hated going home. really did. So the journey home was different. We cried most of the way. Well, I certainly did, um, because we knew we wouldn't be going for another year. So it was a very miserable thing. Going home was miserable, but going there was lovely. To come back home after being away for a week, I think a couple of times it was a fortnight, but even a week seemed forever at that age. And when you come back home, the world looks quite different when you return. Mum and Dad used to take us abroad after, you know, once we were sort of teenage sort of thing, 11, 12, 13. Um, so our holidays were always abroad after that. Um, it wasn't until I had my own child that I started going back to the holiday camp holidays. They, they serve a purpose. I know lots of them are shut down now and there's not as many as there used to be. Um, but some are still going strong. And I think they've, they've certainly found a niche with the sort of themed weekends and the cover bands and tribute bands and stuff and there's lots of big parties there and hen parties and stag parties and when they fell out of favour people you know started to look down on them a little bit and um, you know talk badly about them as people started to do overseas travel and the other things became more exotic and more exciting but at the time they were great. It was a, a complete self-contained sort of episode which I guess holidays are but yeah being transported from from home to a completely different world. It was the time of, we've never had it so good. And anything was possible. And it was joyous. My mum's not here anymore. So I can, I can look back at that really quite golden times where we just shared very simple things. We didn't have much money. So really it's kind of um, spending, but what they would say today is spending quality time with your parents. Oh, happy, very happy memories, yeah. They stay, with, they stay with you forever, those sort of holidays. And the memories with my wife too, you know. 
all, all I remember is it, it felt like my second home and it's probably just because I went every year and because I went so young to begin with, um, I can't remember what I thought the first time I went, but all I know is that whenever I went, it just felt, it was just like coming home. And it still feels like that, even though I don't stay on the camp anymore. If I drive past it, which I have done, I still feel like it's my second home. I get emotional just thinking about it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Oh dear. Anyway, yeah. It's about the people. It's not about how much money you can spend or even what you're, the sights you're seeing or where you're going. I think what really makes a holiday is, is being is with the people who you're having a good time with. 